welcome. It's a very great pleasure for me, uh, for me to welcome you here on behalf of Azim Premji University. So as you know, Azim Premji University organizes this advanced graduate workshop in collaboration with the Initiative for Policy Dialogue at Columbia University, which is where I come from, and, the, and INET, the Institute of New Economic Thinking in New York, where we try and bring together 25 PhD students uh, from across the world working on issues of international development and globalization. And then we try and bring together, uh, bring a few of some of the most more distinguished um, uh, people working in the field. Uh, two of the most distinguished people I have the privilege of introducing today. In fact, I would personally go so far as to say, if you gave, asked me to list 10 most important and interesting people working on issues of development today, uh, certainly uh, uh, Hajun and Robert Wade would be in that list, Hajun Chang and Ru Robert Wade. And one of the reasons that makes them, in my view, particularly interesting and important, as you will see, is because they ask and address really interesting and important big questions, and certainly are not a victim to what is a great uh, uh, um, tendency or fallacy or weakness of economic uh, discipline in modern times, which is where the methodology drives the question that you ask rather than the question. So you know, it doesn't matter how trivial the question as long as you do it rigorously, as many poor PhD students uh, have to suffer that kind of bias. But here are people who ask really big and interesting questions and address them in really big and interesting ways. And the proof will you will see when we speak when they speak so the you know the broad theme of this evening's uh, you know state and, uh, and and market um, the way in which they will interpret it you know we've discussed you will you will know um, they'll both speak for about 45 minutes each and then uh, we will have a question and answer session afterward I don't know what the order is, if, uh, and if they have any preferences on who goes first or second, we actually haven't uh, discussed well, that. I can go but first. we should, on, on, on the basis of alphabetical order also, <laughs> Ha Jun Chang. <laughs> Who's that? By the way, I should, sorry. No, I, yeah, I should mention briefly, Professor Ha Jun Chang teaches at Cambridge University in England. Uh, his perhaps best known work in the sense, it's the longest standing one, is kicking away the ladder, which is a marvelous piece of history, which you will see here something about. But I want to mention, and he's published lots of other publications, but I want to mention his last two publications. Uh, the la penultimate one, which published about three, four years ago, was 23 things they don't tell you about capitalism. And his last one, just published last year, is called Economics, a User's Guide. And that is particularly useful for uh, non both for economists and non-economists. One of the things he tries to do is unveil the e economics uh, behind the veil of, of, of jargon and mathematics that it tries to, con to, to sort of uh, conceal itself or conceal itself, not mystify uh, people with. Uh, the, uh, Robert Wade has published widely and extensively on a variety of different areas and fields. Uh, his first academic work was serious post uh, uh, um, uh, was done actually in uh, two villages, uh, not two villages, in a district, uh, several villages, in a district Karnool, not far from here, and um, from very near place where I was born, actually in Hyderabad, uh, and has published very widely and extensively on a very wide range of subjects and is a very much an engaged public intellectual in, uh, in, in very much involved in all manner of kind of uh, debates and discussions on economic policy. His one, the, one of the titles of his book, which is a famous book on Taiwan, is perhaps my favorite title of any book at all, it's called Governing the Market, which I think it certainly is a brilliant title. Um, anyway, thank you very much. So in that order, Ha Jun Chang and Robert Wei. Thank you, Akbar, for that very kind introduction, and thank you, everyone, for sparing the evening uh, to listen to me. Uh, I'll, I'll try to entertain you, the, given the sacrifice you are making. Um, yeah, let me uh, start with a little story about 
Japan. This was uh, back in 1958. And in that year, Japan tried to export its uh, first passenger car to the United States. The car was called Toyo Pet. And as you can guess from the name, it was a cheap, small, four wheels and an ashtray kind of a car. <laughs> and it was priced so low that the Japanese company that was making it, Toyota, hoped that affluent American customers uh, could buy that with uh, changes left over from their grocery shopping. <laughs> so it had, uh, they had a great hope, but it was a total flop. No one wanted to buy it, so Toyota actually officially withdrew the car. You know, the, the man in black, yeah, Neuralizer. <laughs> you haven't seen it, it was never here. You will understand why when you see this picture, it looked like this, yeah? <laughs> I wouldn't buy that. This uh, sparked off a huge debate in Japan, because the free market economy centered around the central bank, uh, the Bank of Japan, said, look, this is what happens when, oh, yeah. Yeah, when uh, a country like uh, Japan, whose uh, main export item is silk, tries to export capital-intensive products like cars, you know, there's this uh, economic theory called the theory of comparative advantage, which tells you that a country like Japan, which has a lot of labor and very little capital, of course, in relative terms, should not be ex producing and exporting capital-intensive things like cars and steel. And indeed, the Japanese car industry was a joke at the time. You know, Back in 1955, only a few years before this, I couldn't get data exactly for 1957 or 8, the United States produced 7 million cars, of which 3.5 million were produced by General Motors alone. Yeah? In the same year, all Japanese car companies, I think uh, there were 11 or 12 of them at the time, put together produced 70,000 cars, 1% of the United States. The biggest company, Toyota, produced 35,000 cars, exactly 1% of what General Motors was producing. Yeah, so the free market economists had uh, a very strong case that uh, they said, look, I mean, the, the, we should uh, forget this nonsense, we draw the protection, and we draw subsidies, uh, the, and uh, let it go away. And they emphasize that, look, uh, it's not as if uh, this industry didn't have any help. Yeah? They had all the help they can reasonably expect in the, the, in the last uh, you know, the, the 25 years. Uh, the, you know, Toyota was uh, set up uh, in 1933. It has been protected with high tariffs uh, the, since then. In 1938, the Japanese government kicked out uh, General Motors and Ford, which then dominated the Japanese car market in the build-up to the Pacific War, and never let them in again. And the uh, Bank of Japan economists proudly pointed out that back in 1949, we injected public money from our bank to save you from bankruptcy. Yeah? So don't tell us that you haven't had help. Yeah? You have had all the help that get, uh, you can reasonably expect. You still cannot make the cheapest uh, car that can sell in America. Forget about it. Yeah? You know, today we think uh, Japanese cars are as natural as, I don't know, French wine or Scottish salmon. But only 55 years ago, there were a lot of people, including many Jap Japanese themselves, who thought this industry should not exist. Now, luckily for Japan and for the rest of the world, which has eventually benefited from better cars, the protectionists uh, prevailed the day and the Japanese government continued with this support for the industry, and the rest is history. Hmm? You know, today, Toyota is the biggest car company in the world. Their cars uh, look like this. <laughs> yeah, big, big uh, change from those days. Yeah? <laughs> so next time when you meet a free trade economist, ask him what car he drives. If he drives a Japanese car, 
or for that matter, Korean car, which was developed in the same way through protection and restrictions on trade, the guy doesn't know what he's talking about. Huh? <laughs> well, I can give you more examples from Japan, from my native South Korea, like this. Yeah? I wouldn't go into the details, but uh, the, when I do that, however, many people say, oh, yeah, well, the, maybe Japan, maybe Korea, but uh, there are exceptions, you know, I mean, the, the, those are strange people eating rice with chopsticks, you know. <laughs> how, how can you learn from them, you know? All the other rich countries have become rich uh, through free trade and free market policies. Yeah? So, yes, uh, exceptions that prove the rule. But the truth is that, as I try to show in my book, uh, Kicking on the Ladder, that uh, Akbar mentioned and some of the other publications, starting with 18th century Britain, virtually all of today's rich countries developed by using policies like protectionism, heavy regulations on foreign direct investment, state owned enterprises, and government subsidies. <coughs> Now, Britain's a very interesting case because uh, people think uh, the British invented free trade. No, actually, they invented protectionism. Huh? <laughs> you know, until the 17th century, Britain was a backward country which was uh, dependent on raw wool exports to the low countries or what are uh, the Netherlands and Belgium today, especially Flanders. <coughs> Woolen manufacturing was the high-tech industry of Europe at the time and Britain was a raw material supplier. So kings like uh, Edward III, Henry VII, they implemented uh, schemes to protect uh, domestic woolen manufacturing by, for example, discouraging raw wool exports uh, by taxing wool export or, or providing uh, the, the tariff protection or even poaching skilled workers from the low countries. And actually, that history still lives because without those attempts by those kings, we won't have 007, <laughs> Penicillin, or Ned Flanders, my favorite <laughs> character from The Simpsons. Why do I say that? Because 007 was uh, written by Ian Fleming, Penicillin was uh, invented by Alexander Fleming, and Fleming is the guy from Flanders, yeah? <laughs> like Ned Flanders. Yeah? So, you know, I mean, the, the, this, all this evidence sitting in front of you saying, <laughs> telling you that uh, the British invented uh, protectionism rather than free trade, and we don't know that, uh, what these are. Hmm? Another important attempt by the, uh, the British uh, in the 17th and 18th century was to ban cotton textile imports from India which was uh, the best at the, at the cotton at the time, known as calicos. Hmm? In 1699, the British government bans cotton imports from the India and woolen imports uh, from the island, because uh, these were superior to British producers. Hmm? And actually, there's a very interesting uh, the, 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 the passage uh, from uh, a pamphlet written by Daniel Defoe, who, the guy who wrote Robinson Crusoe, where he travels around the, the uh, around Britain, and he visits uh, Norwich, which was then the central cotton textile yeah. uh, in Britain, and he says, "This is great. I mean, because of that ban on <coughs> Indian calicos, now this town's uh, cotton industry is so thriving. Even children aged uh, four or five can get a job. Yeah, isn't this great? Yeah, <laughs> those are the days. Yeah." But uh, in 1721, British industrial policy gets further impetus by this man, uh, Robert Walpole, known as uh, the first prime minister of Britain. He's uh, these days only known for his uh, corruption because he was uh, a fantastically corrupt guy. <laughs> but he was also a very competent economic manager. He was brought into government to clean out the mess uh, from the South Sea bubble of uh, 1721. This was one of the most uh, famous uh, the, uh, asset bubbles in history. Uh, yeah, basically, some politicians uh, that with backing from uh, the king uh, that set up this company called the South Sea Company, and 
in Britain, South Sea, those days uh, meant uh, Latin America. Eh? And they got uh, the monopoly over trade with uh, Latin America and said this was a great uh, prospect because we have monopoly with uh, the, the, uh, over trade with Latin America. Well, except that at the time, Britain and Spain were at war almost all the time, so they actually managed to send one ship in 10 years. Yeah? Never mind that. I mean, uh, if you talk it up uh, that, uh, hardly enough, uh, that, uh, that people will believe it. So in 1720, there was a huge uh, speculative boom about uh, this uh, company. Share prices went up nine times. Apparently, Isaac Newton lost uh, the today's equivalent of 20 million pounds uh, in that uh, speculative boom and lamented that I can predict the movements of heavenly bodies, but I cannot uh, fathom human madness. <laughs> so the, 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 there was a huge mess, and Robert Walpole was uh, brought in to sort this out. So he did a lot of uh, financial reform, reform of government finance, but he also introduced, well, what I can only describe as uh, East Asian style industrial policies. Yeah? <laughs> because he increased uh, protection, well, the formatting is a bit. Uh, uh, increased uh, protection for British manufacturing industries, provided export subsidies lower tariffs on industrial inputs, impose quality control on certain exports uh, by the state so that they can maintain the sort of reputation of made in England the, the, the labor, and extended import tariff rebates on inputs used for exporting. What does this does is, you know, this, I mean, that happens uh, when a country has uh, protection for everything. Yeah? So that uh, if you are making, say, washing machines uh, that, uh, with imported uh, steel plates, actually the protection you get on the washing machine maybe not may not be enough because uh, the, you know you are actually paying higher prices for your steels. Yeah? So that this is a common problem, and at least uh, in order to increase uh, your export competitiveness, the government gives you back the tariff that you have paid on the steel plates if you export the washing machines. Eh? And I thought, until I did research on Robert Walpole's economic policy, I thought this was invented in Japan in the 1950s. Eh? <laughs> no, actually, this was invented in Britain before, actually, Walpole in the uh, 17th century, although Walpole extended it uh, to many industries. And yeah, the, there you go. I mean. The, Basically, between Walpole's uh, the policy reform and the repeal of the Corn Laws, the law, laws uh, protecting agricultural, especially grain imports, in 1846, Britain implemented a most aggressive infant industry protection program, basically pr trying to protect your young industries against superior foreign competitors. So if you look at uh, that table in the early 19th century, you see that actually the UK had, well, of the countries where you could uh, get uh, sufficient data, the highest average industrial tariff rate in the world. Now, when I say the world, some of you might be thinking, my God, I mean, that guy lived in England too long. Uh, you know, there are about 15 countries there, and he thinks uh, that's the world. But actually, for the purpose of tariffs, this was about the world at the time, because for most of this period, other countries that do not appear in this table were either colonies or were subject to unequal treaties and couldn't, didn't have uh, power to set their own tariffs. Huh? No, actually one reason why in 1875 tariff rate in Japan was only 5%, was because they were bound by all these unequal treaties that uh, they were forced to sign in 1856, uh, when, sorry, 53, when they were uh, forced to open by the Americans. Eh? So, you know, of course, India was a colony, so that uh, no tariff at all, but even nominally independent countries like uh, Thailand and Turkey and Iran and so on, all were bound by this, and the, the Latin American countries until the 1870s were bound by the, these unequal treaties, so they could uh, use tariffs only up to three, maybe 5%. Eh? So actually, this table 
includes almost all the countries that had the power to set their own tariffs. Eh? Uh, the exceptions are Portugal and I think uh, the Norway, but then Norway was uh, the same country as Sweden as uh, the, the, uh, until the until 1905. So yeah, so basically this is it. Yeah? And you see that that uh, the UK had the, the very high tariff uh, in those days. Now the repeal of the Corn Laws is uh, these days commonly regarded as the ultimate victory of the classical liberal economic doctrine of a wrong-headed uh, mercantilism. So, uh, for example, if you read the book uh, by Professor Jagdish Bhagwati, the leading free trade theorist, that uh, the, the, the title "Protectionism in 1985," he actually starts his book with that story. Uh, in 1846, some far-sighted uh, British politicians forced uh, the government to abolish uh, protection of uh, the uh, ag agricultural imports. So the agricultural the, the, the producers, uh, mainly grain producers, yeah? corn at the time meant grain, not uh, sweet corn as uh, they do usually these days. But uh, people point out that this was actually an act of uh, free trade imperialism because the thinking behind it, which you can see from the quote uh, by Richard Copton, the, the politician who led uh, this uh, anti movement, the thinking behind this was, of course, I mean, one of it was uh, to import cheaper food to drive down wages so that uh, profits that, uh, would increase and, you know, that, that therefore investment and growth and so on. But another thinking was that uh, this would actually help Britain to push other countries back into agriculture. The argument was that we have been actually encouraging the Germans and the Americans and uh, the French and so on to industrialize by refusing to import their grains. Yeah? So if we actually lower the tariffs and import more grains, they'll voluntarily move back into agriculture. Yeah? So this is a, 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 a two birds with one stone kind of strategy. Yeah? Britain fully adopted free trade only in the 1860s when its uh, industrial supremacy became unquestionable. And it was on the basis of these historical facts uh, that Friedrich List, uh, the 19th century German economist, who's uh, today commonly but mistakenly, as I'll explain uh, shortly, known as the father of infant industry protection argument, condemned the British advocacy of free trade as an act of kicking away the ladder. Yeah? Basically, he's saying, well, the British tell us, Germans and the Americans, uh, these two countries are very much identified with each other at the time, to, to adopt free trade. But actually, if you look at British history, when did they do free trade? They never did the free trade until they became rich. So the British telling us not to use free trade is uh, like someone climbing up the ladder and kicking that ladder away so that other people can follow. Hence uh, the cover and the title of uh, my earlier book that uh, Akbar kindly mentioned. It gets even more interesting because if uh, Britain was the first country to have uh, succeeded by using infant industry protection, the first country to have theorized it is the United States. And the person who did that is an American who is so famous that most of you actually even know what it looks like even though he's been dead for two centuries. Yeah? Except that you don't know who he is. Yeah? It's uh, this guy, Alexander Hamilton, the first Treasury Secretary of the United States. You know, Hamilton became uh, the Treasury Secretary at the outrageously young age of uh, the 33 in 1789. Two years later, he submits this report to the US Congress in which uh, he develops this theory to justify the kind of policies that uh, Britain, especially under Robert Walpole, used. Yeah? And he calls it actually the infant industry argument. He invented the name. And to, I mean, it's a, a very simple but very powerful idea. And to explain it in an intuitive way, I uh, 
in the third chapter of this book uh, called Bad Samaritans, I uh, uh, used the following uh, narrative. That, uh, the third chapter of this book is uh, titled My Six-Year-Old Son Should Get a Job. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, you know, the children have this annoying habit of growing up, so that he's already 14, but, uh, you know, he'll have to remain six-year-old uh, for my literary integrity, and I'm sure he'll <laughs> hate me for the rest of uh, the, his life uh, for it. You know, apparently that A.A. The, the a. Millen's uh, son, who was uh, written up as uh, Christopher Robin in Winnie the Pooh, hated his father until the day he died because as soon as he, people knew that he was that guy, yeah, people immediately yeah, thought uh, he was uh, six years old. Yeah? <laughs> anyway, so the, in the book I say, well, I have this uh, six-year-old son, and well, I don't use uh, such a uh, crude language in the book, but uh, uh, I say he's basically a parasite. Yeah? Yeah, I mean, I pay for his food, his uh, lodging, his education, his health care, his, you know, the, the Nintendo games, you know. <laughs> yeah, so I get thinking, hmm, maybe I can save money by not sending him to school, but uh, to send him to work. And then I realized this is a win-win situation because uh, that, uh, if he starts working at such an early age, it will make him more competitive in the labor market. You know? <laughs> No more fooling around with uh, his Nintendo games. No more wasting time in front of TV. He should, you know, access that uh, practice his uh, shoe shining skill or <laughs> chewing gum selling skill or whatever that uh, occupation he uh, ends up uh, taking. Yeah, and then I think, uh, well, but you know, the, he's actually quite clever. So if I kept him in school for another 12, 15 years and supported him through that. Maybe it can become a lot of things, you know. The, I don't know that the architect, you know, chemical engineer, not economist, no, no. <laughs> uh, you know, the nuclear physicist, whatever. Yeah, so I think I'll probably keep him in school. Of course, uh, there's a good chance that this guy might turn out to be a total waste of time. You know? <laughs> No, I mean, you know, he could be, you know, the, the, I mean, the, without a job and live with me until he's uh, 33, like uh, the Jesus Christ did, you know. <laughs> yeah, so that there is that chance, but, you know, I don't know about other people, but I would uh, still send him to school because, yes, I mean, even if uh, there's, I don't know, 30% chance or even 40% chance that he'll turn out to be a total waste of time. I know that if I kicked him into the labor market today, well, when he was six, he will never become one of those things that I think he might become. There will be, well, 0.00001% chance. Yeah? I'm not going to bank on that. Yeah? yeah, so it's that idea. you know, Very simple but very powerful idea. Yeah? Hamilton invented, uh, well, theorized this idea, saying that Governments of the uh, uh, economically backward nations uh, need to protect and nurture their young industries until they grow up and can compete with the uh, superior in the, uh, industries uh, from more advanced uh, countries. Now, you think this is obvious, but uh, when he said that, he was actually going against the advice uh, from the world's greatest economist, Adam Smith, who explicitly advised the Americans, try not to develop your manufacturing industry. This will be bad for you. Huh? Of course, uh, this is what the free trade economists uh, that tell developing countries today. And despite this, uh, Hamilton said, well, thank you, but no thank you. I know what is good for my country. Please go away. Huh? You know, if uh, some finance minister of, I don't know, Ecuador or, you know, uh, Ethiopia did that today, I mean, the country will be blackballed in the international financial market and probably the American government will send in the Marines, you know. Mm -hmm. But he had the cost to say this. And who was he? I mean, he wasn't even an economist. You know? He only had a liberal arts degree from what then was a second-rate college called the King's College of New York. 
Do you know what that college is called today? <laughs> Columbia University, yeah? <laughs> yeah, actually, that, uh, when you go there, there's a Hamilton Hall. Yeah? There's no record that he ever studied any economics. Yeah? I mean, he initially wanted to become a medical doctor, so studied anatomy, and then got interested in philosophy and mathematics. So, you know, you can call it liberal arts, but, uh, you know, it was more of a dog's breakfast uh, kind of degree. <laughs> and the guy had the guts to say to the greatest economist uh, of the time, you are wrong. Yeah? This is what is uh, good for my country. Well, no wonder the other Americans were not convinced, you know. Uh, many other Americans, including Thomas Jefferson, the Hamilton's political arch enemy, said, look, this is nonsense. You know, we can export the cotton and tobacco that we produce, export them to uh, the Europe, and import manufactured goods, which are much better and cheaper than what this, uh, the, the Yankee producers can give us, so why should we subsidize these uh, Yankee producers? Yeah? We don't want that. Yeah? At the time, the U.S. Congress was uh, basically dominated by southern landlords, so they uh, refused uh, to accept uh, Hamilton's recommendation. And Hamilton, unfortunately, meets an early death uh, in 1804. Uh, you know, he was basically killed in a pistol duel. Uh, and was uh, shot dead by someone called Aaron Burr, who happened to be the serving vice president of the time. You know, these are wild days, you know. <laughs> serving vice president shoots uh, the ex-finance minister dead and no one goes to prison. Eh? <laughs> so he dies in 1804, so he never sees the day when his uh, plans adopted. But actually, after their uh, experience with the Anglo-American War of 1812 to 16, many Americans come around to Hamilton's view. To become a strong country, we need a manufacturing industry, and to do that, we need infant industry protection. So they introduced uh, high tariffs uh, from the 1820s, already uh, climbing up, and then basically, well, you cannot see it all here, but between 1830s and 40s and the Second World War, the U.S. remained the most protected economy in the world, well, for some brief exceptional periods when the Russians you know, that, uh, jack up their tariffs in the uh, early 20th century and so on. And it wasn't just uh, the UK or the US, but a similar story applies to all the other rich countries of today. So all of today's rich countries, except for the Netherlands and Switzerland before World War I, used uh, protectionism for substantial periods. And as I mentioned earlier, it wasn't the UK or the US uh, that uh, uh, invented free trade. These were in their own uh, catch-up periods, the most uh, protected economies in the world. And interestingly, countries like France, Germany, and Japan, countries normally thought to be the homes of protectionism, did not use protectionism as vigorously as Britain or the US did, although they might have uh, used the other industrial policies more aggressively. Huh? And even in the post-Second uh, World War period, uh, protection was quite high until the 1960s. Uh, so you see you know, uh, all these uh, tariffs, uh, the tariff levels. You know, today, developing countries' average industrial tariff is about 10%. Yeah? And all these countries had uh, tariffs are uh, higher than that for most of the period. Yeah? And sometimes going up to 40, 50 you know, uh, the percent like in the United States. Yeah? And also some of these uh, the, the relatively low averages uh, could hide a lot of uh, variations uh, as it did exactly in uh, East Asia. So the, for example, Belgium might have had you know, nine, ten percent tariffs in the late 19th, early 20th century, but some industries got very high protection. Iron and steel industry got 80 percent, textile got 65, and so on. And uh, yeah, I mean, this is uh, one measure of uh, protectionism which shows that Britain was actually more protected than France well into the, yeah. uh, the 
19th century. And this is a uh, post-war tariff uh, figures. You know, I mentioned that today's uh, average industrial tariff in developing countries is 10% uh, <coughs> around. So many countries had tariff rates higher than that into the 60s, even 70s. Eh? Similar picture holds in other policy areas. Uh, so many of today's rich countries regulated foreign direct investment when they were at the receiving end. <coughs> So in the 19th century, the U.S. very heavily regulated FDI in finance, shipping, mining, and logging. You know, this was a time actually when there were relatively few FDIs in manufacturing. So the, the regulation was uh, concentrated in this area, especially in banking. Only American citizens could become directors in a national bank, as opposed to state-level bank. And foreign shareholders could not even vote in annual general meetings. Yeah? So they could own shares and draw dividends uh, from US banks, but they could actually not vote. Yeah? You know, today, that, uh, if you go to countries like Korea or Mexico, you know, there are many bank presidents who are foreigners. Yeah? In America in those days, uh, you couldn't even become a director if you are not an American citizen. Yeah? <coughs> Japan and Korea and Thailand, to a lesser extent, virtually banned uh, foreign direct investment until the 1980s. Finland, uh, you know, until the 80s, Finland classified all firms with more than 20% foreign ownership as dangerous enterprises. Yeah? And I haven't made up these terms. Yeah? It's uh, the official Finnish term. Yeah? Well, the foreigners got uh, this subtle hint and kept away. So until the 80s, I mean, of course, uh, from the 90s, uh, when it joined the European Union, it was a different story. But until the 80s, uh, Finland was completely protected uh, from foreign direct investment. There were no foreign bank branches in Finland until the early 1980s and so on. And same story with uh, state-owned enterprises. Well, Germany and Japan, in the early days of their industrialization, used uh, state-owned enterprises to kick-start the, the process. Uh, so they would typically set up uh, state-owned enterprises in key industries, grow them, and then privatize them. But uh, state-owned enterprises were extensively used in France, Finland, Austria, Norway, Taiwan, and Singapore in the post-Second uh, World War period. Actually, Singapore is an extremely interesting case because uh, if you read about Singapore in the financial press or in standard economics books, uh, you will only read about its free trade policy and its welcoming attitude towards uh, foreign direct investment. But you will never be told that 90% of land in Singapore is owned by the government, 85% of housing is provided by government-owned housing corporation, and a staggering 22% of GDP is produced by state-owned enterprises, including the famous Singapore Airlines. Huh? So I often put it to my students, look, give me one economic theory that can explain Singapore. It doesn't matter what it is, neoclassical, Marxist, Keynesian, Schumpeterian. There's no theory that can do that. Huh? Well, Taiwan is a bit less extreme than Singapore, but still, I mean, uh, of course, that uh, Robert, that, uh, that, uh, We'll be able to tell you a lot more about uh, Taiwan, but 16% uh, of GDP is uh, still produced by state-owned enterprises today. It was much, much higher earlier. And you know, all the French farms that you have ever heard of, they are either still state-owned or used to be state-owned. And if I stretch it a bit, uh, I may even say that the most successful state-owned enterprise in human history has been the U.S. military. Yeah, no, no I mean, that, that is another that, uh, joke, I mean, a bit of an exaggeration, but, you know, most of the sectors in which uh, the uh, U.S. has international technological leadership are sectors first created and often e promoted even later by the U.S. military. Eh? The computer and the internet came from Pentagon research. Very few people know this, but the semiconductor was initially entirely financed by the U.S. Navy, 
the U.S. aircraft industry wouldn't be what it is uh, today without uh, U.S. Air Force uh, funding for research and development. And indeed, uh, even in sectors like pharmaceutical and bioengineering, 30% of R&D is uh, provided by U.S. Uh, the government through the famous National Institutes of Health. So I that, 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 uh, joke that the most uh, important industrial policy of the United States is to tell other people that it doesn't have industrial policy by not calling its industrial policy federal research funding. Hmm? Yeah, and then stupid countries like uh, my own South Korea actually believes it and says, yeah, we should abolish our industrial policy because Americans say that they don't do it. Hmm? <laughs> That's uh, very effective. Hmm? We see the same picture in the area of intellectual property rights. Uh, you know, many countries actually explicitly allowed patenting of foreigners' inventions. So, for example, in 1852, a British guy called Peter Duran took out a, a patent on canning technology, which was uh, actually invented by a Frenchman called Nicolas Pierre. But he could actually legally get a patent on it because he was the first one to, yeah. Uh, applied that, that for this uh, that, that in Britain, and in the application, he actually explicitly wrote that I got this technology from a foreigner. Hmm? It was totally legal. You might have thought counterfeiting was invented in East Asia, but actually it was invented in Germany. In the 19th century, the Germans mass-produced fake Made in England products. Hmm? It became such an incident that in 1862, the British Parliament actually changed uh, its uh, trademark law, which was then called the Merchandise Act, to say that trademark includes the place of manufacture. Hmm? So they thought uh, this will uh, scupper all this uh, the evil German plan to undermine our industries. Germans are far too determined and far too clever for that. So they started producing things like watches that, yeah, said, made in Germany, but only on the box, yeah? Mm -hmm. And once you throw out the box, uh, the watch uh, look exactly like the English watch, yeah? Mm -hmm. Or the funny story I can give you is that, that, that there was this uh, German company producing industrial sewing machine with uh, words like uh, Northern England machine splashed over the body and made in Germany tucked underneath. Uh, the only minor problem was that, that this machine was so heavy, you needed six people to lift it. So no one th 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 knew these were made in Germany. Hmm? <laughs> Switzerland until 1907 and the Netherlands until 1912 refused to protect patents. But actually, these were consistent countries because, that, uh, as I mentioned earlier, these are the only two countries that can legitimately claim to have used uh, free trade. And in rejecting to product uh, patterns, they use that argument. They say, we are free trading nations. And we cannot possibly endorse protectionist measures, you know, artificially created you know, uh, property rights like intellectual property rights. You know? This is why in America, the protectionist Alexander Hamilton was in favor of patterns, and the free trader Thomas Jefferson was against patterns. You know? Yeah, because Thomas Jefferson said, ideas are like air. I mean, how can you say you own it? Yeah? We need uh, competition everywhere. Mm -hmm. Actually, even after it uh, introduced this uh, patent law, the European uh, the, the con uh, well, actually, the, it was not just them. I mean, all the European countries until the 1950s, 60s, and 70s refused to protect substance patterns in chemicals and pharmaceuticals. You know, India was uh, bullied so much uh, for not allowing substance patterns uh, in pharmaceutical, which uh, allowed India to produce a lot of copy drugs. Yeah? But uh, this was uh, what was uh, routinely done in Europe. Yeah? I mean, the Switzerland the, the introduced a pharmaceutical substance pattern only in the 1970s. Yeah? I mean, Canada and Spain in, only in the 1990s. Yeah? So, you know, the history is uh, the, the very different from you know, what uh, you think it is. Yeah? Anyway, I mean, the, even on copyright issues, uh, that uh, I can show you that. So the history of uh, capitalism is a bit like this. You know, 
well, the, you know the, who the guy the center is, uh, and I'm sure many of you know the guy who's on the left of Lenin. Uh, I'm not even going to ask you to name the guy who's on the right of uh, Lenin because uh, I've asked this uh, to thousands of people and there's only one Mexican uh, former Marxist the professor who could name him. This guy was uh, called Kamenev. Yeah, he was actually quite a big uh, deal because uh, he was uh, Trotsky's uh, brother-in-law. He was a uh, one-time editor of uh, Pravda, the, the Soviet official newspaper, and uh, the, he was uh, in one of many triumvirates uh, that uh, Joseph uh, Stalin went through before he became the sole dictator. Anyway, so the, when Stalin came to power, he couldn't let these kind of photos be seen, so he doctored the picture and said this was all single-handedly done by Comrade Lenin. Yeah, and you know, this is uh, the power of technology. I mean, uh, today my son can do this on the Photoshop, but uh, at that time this was uh, the state of art technology possessed only by the KGB, you know. So people that uh, were shown these photos, you know, there were no Trotsky and Kamenev uh, around Lenin, you know. The, the, the photos never lie, you know. So the, I say the history of capitalism is a bit like that because that, uh, of course at the center was the market, but then there was also the protection and regulation. Yeah? <laughs> well, today we are told that it was all single-handedly done by the market. <laughs> well, of course, uh, at when the, the I present this evidence, uh, the people point out, look, the coexistence of interventionist policies. Oh, sorry. Yeah. The coexistence of intervention policies does not prove that those policies cause economic development. Yeah? Sorry, coexistence of inter intervention policies and economic development, I'm sorry, in today's rich countries in those days does not prove that those intervention policies actually cause the latter. Yeah? Well, that may be the case, but no, my argument, uh, counter argument is that well, free trade and free market policies didn't even coexist. Yeah, they were never there. So how can you say that those things made these countries develop? Yeah, yeah and then the, the counter argument that comes back is, oh no, no, but uh, you know the, those countries uh, su succeeded because, uh, sorry, despite not because of those policies. Yeah? So uh, had they not used those protectionist policies, you could have done, uh, they could have done even better. <laughs> or they say they were countervailing factors. So they argue that, for example, the US succeeded uh, despite having very high tariffs because it had other conditions that uh, made economic development possible like large internal markets that uh, reduced uh, the negative impact of uh, protectionism rich natural resources and a lot of uh, immigration and so on. Well, once again, I mean, that is sound plausible, but then how do you explain that many other countries that did not have those conditions also use similar policies and economically succeed? You know, if uh, protection is uh, uh, large size of the market was so important, how do you explain the fact that Finland, you know, with three, four million people at the time when it was developing could develop with uh, such high tariffs. Yeah? I mean, if uh, the, having a lot of natural resources was such a good thing, how do you explain South Korea or Japan? Yeah? I mean, if uh, immigration was uh, such a positive factor, how do you then explain countries that were bleeding people like uh, Germany and Sweden in the 19th century or tw Taiwan in the 20th century? Yeah? yeah, so this offsetting conditions argument may work when you are looking at individual cases in isolation, when, but when you have 20, 30 countries with very different con conditions using similar policies, similar unorthodox policies, and succeeding, that argument simply falls apart. And also, you know, in that argument, the implicit assumption is that intervention policies are bad for economic development, but uh, there are many respectable economic theories, including the infant industry argument, justifying certain types of intervention policies. Yeah? 
So to conclude, uh, what are the lessons that we can draw from this? Right, historical evidence clearly shows that an active role of the state is necessary for economic development. Well, this is not surprising uh, that uh, given that uh, there's no dearth of uh, economic theories that justify state intervention, especially in developing countries. Of course, uh, this does not mean that all theoretically justified state intervention will succeed because the quality of the policy design and implementation also matters. Eh? So the, you need to think about you know, the, the political economy, the institutional setup, bureaucrat bureaucratic capabilities, and uh, so on. But uh, here I would uh, like to urge you not to be kind of fatalistic or pessimistic. Eh? Because that, uh, you know, people think, oh, we cannot uh, that use uh, the Japanese or Korean or Chinese kind of industrial policy because those countries that uh, started with a good human capital base and wonderful institutions and highly capable bureaucracy, this is all nonsense, yeah? In 1945, South Korea's literacy rate was 22%. You know, in, until the 1960s, we were sending people to Pakistan and the Philippines to learn about economic policy making. Yeah? You know, these are all built. You know? So, I mean, I, I really that, that don't, I mean, don't get me wrong. I mean, you have to be realistic. Yeah? You have to be realistic about the capabilities and institutions that you have today. So you cannot, as we say in Korea, that try to run before you can walk. Yeah? But in the long run, you can and you should uh, change these things. Yeah? Uh, unfortunately, the, 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 the usual response when they hear stories about you know, 19th century America or 20th century Taiwan or whatever, they say, well, we are not Taiwan, we are not the US. Yeah, yeah but then Taiwan then was not Taiwan today. The US then was not US today. Yeah? It was just fantastically corrupt. Yeah? I mean, the, the bad, really bad institutions, yeah? <laughs> no, I mean, the, you didn't believe it. I mean, I cannot go into that, but uh, if you read uh, chapter three of my book, uh, Kicking at the Ladder, you would realize how institutionally deficient these countries were when they were actually industrializing. Well, more about uh, there are many different ways to mix uh, state intervention and markets. So it is important to learn lessons from others and also to experiment. You know, the, my favorite motto is that life is often stranger than fiction. Yeah? You've seen the example of Singapore. Yeah? You know, if you ask that uh, economists uh, to come up with a model that works, they would have never come up with uh, something like Singapore. Yeah? No, because uh, it doesn't fit any theory. Yeah? So that uh, you have to actually look at a lot of real world experiences uh, to get ideas about uh, how to do this. And also you have to yeah, internally uh, experiment, yeah? which uh, the Chinese were very good uh, in the last uh, few decades. Yeah? Uh, good about that uh, in the last few decades. Yeah? So, we need to be pragmatic and devise solutions that work rather than believing in particular theories, whether they are, I don't know, free market theory or infant industry protection or uh, theory of uh, late development or whatever, and trying to find excuses when they don't work in practice. You know, for example, when all these uh, pro market reforms fail to work in Africa in the 1980s and 1990s uh, under the IMF World Bank uh, Structure Adjustment Program, people started producing all these arguments saying why Africa was uh, the destined to low growth. You know? So that, that they talked about the tropical climate, you know, increasing health costs, you know, being landlocked, uh, that making international trade difficult. You know, that they talked about bad culture. You know, that, that any number of things that, that, that which I that, uh, call. ABP, anything but policy, because they couldn't accept that these policies that are supposed to be correct policies didn't work there. So that, you know, that, that is not what we should do. You know, I mean, that we should accept that 
reality is very complex. Yeah? Uh, we don't really fully understand how these uh, different things uh, fit together. So we should uh, learn from history, learn from experiences of other countries, uh, do experiment and be pragmatic. I mean, if it uh, doesn't fit your favorite theory but works, uh, so be it. Yeah? I mean, that's my that, uh, attitude, that, uh, which uh, the, some people I'm sure wouldn't agree, but uh, I think uh, that's uh, what has made all these uh, countries successful. You know? If uh, Alexander Hamilton believed in the, the, the theory of Adam Smith, or if uh, the Japanese uh, the, uh, government officials in the 1980s uh, believed in the Ricardo's uh, theory of comparative advantage and so on, they would have never done these kind of things. So the, that's uh, the, the, uh, well, unfortunately for but, uh, people who love their theories, uh, that's how the, really, uh, the world really works. Thank you very much. Great, but I believe the organizers would not allow that. <laughs> However, uh, just mentally, you have to really adjust your mind because I'm going to talk about something quite different. I'm going to talk about global warming. Um, and I'm going to have to... Um, I'm going to... I have a PowerPoint here, but I'm going to skip quite a bit of the um, earlier part of it. Um, it, because I, what really w I want to get to is the question of why uh, global warming as a phenomenon has not, uh, at least not yet, got political traction. It's not um, yet uh, incorporated um, to a prominent place on governmental agendas, that is, serious government agendal, uh, agendas as distinct from rhetorical government agendas. Um, but uh, just before I, I come to that question about why it has not become a hot subject, so to speak, I want to um, just make some points about um, the science and about the skeptics of the science. Um, so I want to um, begin with the point that there is a near um, universal consensus amongst climate scientists. Um, uh, I'm not a climate scientist, um, but I was rather shocked when I read the following comment from a friend of mine who is an agricultural economist, so he's not a climate scientist, but he has a distinguished record of involvement in policy, including in development developing countries. He worked for some years in the Ford Foundation in Delhi. He was head of the International Irrigation or Water Management Institute and so on. And he said to me in an email in November, there has been zero trend, zero trend in temperature over the past 14 years with a 24% increase in atmospheric CO2. I regard this hiatus or pause that is this constancy of global temperature at the same time as there's an increase in CO2 concentrations as a refutation of 260 climate models, since none of these models even hinted at such an event. So this, um, this uh, comment uh, suggested to me that I really had to take a more serious look at the subject than I had been uh, before. So. I want to um, begin by just showing you a few charts uh, on the, uh, which provide some of the basis, the scientific basis on which the recent um, IPCC, IPCC, IPCC stands for, as you will know, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Um, I want to show just a little bit of the scientific basis on which their very pessimistic warnings rest. Um, and the first point to show you is this chart. This is known as the Keeling curve after Charles Keeling, and it shows the uh, global concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere, in this case from 1960 through to today, and the basic point. Can I move away from this microphone? Is that all right in terms of the... There is, there is also a handheld. You can use the handheld. 